please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. On Overdrive today, we're driving the all new Maruti Suzuki Swift and Shumi is attending a workshop at the Harley Davidson University. We also wrap up the latest news from the motoring world and Shumi will answer all of your queries on Auto Selector. Hi, welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, so we need that. Now, Maruti Suzuki Swift was always one of the more popular hatchbacks from the brand in India, and now in its all new avatar, the Swift has become a lot more appealing and as just as much hotly anticipated. Now, we got a chance to drive this car in India. Take a look. Suzuki is a master at building hatchbacks. In fact, they are so good at it that they have often created multiple options within the same car category and quite successfully. Now, a couple of years back, they decided to do something similar in the premium hatchback space. They created the Bellino for the mature audience and then let the Swift take shape as a more fun-loving and youthful car. It's right here and it's taken a little longer than expected to reach the Indian market. But now that it is here, let's take a look at how it's evolved. We've already seen that face on the Desire and there are many of them out on the road already. Does that mean that the Swift won't look fresh anymore? I don't think so. The Swift looks refreshing and that is not only down to the sporty metallic colours that you see here but also because its silhouette has become synonymous with the idea of an affordable, fun hatchback. It marries the familiar shape of the Swift with the curvaceous lines of the Bellino, the car that it shares its platform with. If you look at both these cars closely, you will notice a certain degree of resemblance in the headlights, the taillights, even the character lines, especially these haunches right here. And I like the way these curves are highlighted and that's thanks to the door handle being neatly integrated into the C-pillar. Suzuki has given a black treatment to all the pillars of the car, giving the roof a more pronounced floating effect than before. The Z trim that you see here is expected to be the more popular one and looks quite handsome. Choose the range topping Z Plus trim and you also get LED projector lamps and daytime running lights and the sleeker machine finished alloy wheels. So in terms of design, yes, it still has the familiar shape but has plenty of new design bits that make it evolutionary in form. Compared to the outgoing Swift, the new one is shorter in length, longer in wheelbase and a little bit wider too. The engine compartment has shrunk in size as well. So does that mean that it liberates more space on the inside? Yes, it does. There's better knee room, there's better headroom, even the shoulder room sees improvement. I would still call this cabin good enough for a nuclear family, but you can squeeze in three adults if you really, really have to. I even like the area of the glass house. It gives the cabin a nice, roomy and airy feel. Our first impressions about the seat at the back and the front are positive, but we would like to reserve our opinion on the comfort till we drive them on a long distance. The controls fall easily at hand and the centre console is tilted by 5 degrees towards the driver to contribute towards better ergonomics. But you will wonder, how different is this cabin compared to the outgoing Swift? I know where you're coming from. The all-black treatment for the cabin, it's very old-school Swift, right? But then, it works in our conditions. Even the switch gear, yep, even that comes from the old Swift. And even that continues to work. I know there could have been a little more novelty to the cabin. The plastics could have had a soft touch finish. There could have been a rear AC vent. But then what you do get is a flat bottom steering wheel. And if you choose the top spectrum, you also get this touchscreen infotainment system. That gets you satellite navigation, a reversing camera, and Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and mirroring compatibility. You also get automatic temperature control and the noise of the blowers has reduced considerably. However, I do miss the cool cup holder that was present on the outgoing car. You wouldn't be wrong to expect a little more design flair from this cabin, but then the idea or the focus of this car is to be more driver-centric and there's more to it than just a tilted centre console. That brings us to the chassis. The new hardtech platform is lighter and no matter what variant or trim you choose, the new Swift doesn't tip the scales beyond a ton. Does that mean that it feels floaty at high speeds? Not at least at legal highway speeds. The car does feel light on its feet, but it doesn't feel unnerving. 
and then again this swift could continue the legacy of being a modest toy there's enough space in those wheel arches to allow larger rims upsized tires if you do the right calculations of course and then there is also a lot of room in that engine bay inviting all sorts of engine mods and engine swaps but what has maruti suzuki decided to plonk in there continue to trust the services of the 1.2 liter petrol and the 1.3 liter diesel engines that power almost every Maruti Suzuki this side of 6 lakh rupees and like all their cars based on the lightweight hardtech platform these engines feel more than adequate to do the job and then some while the nvh levels have been ironed out pretty well on the petrol the aging diesel engine still makes itself heard but i'll still choose the oiler over the petrol for the punchy performance that it offers The weight savings also bring out better fuel economy from these engines, claim Maruti Suzuki. The 5-speed manual gearbox is smooth and still has the likable click between gear selections. For those looking at more convenience, the Swift finally goes automatic too. Like the Desire, the Swift also now allows you to choose the automated manual transmission with both the petrol and the diesel options. Now I've tried various combinations during this drive and I must admit I started to like that AMT quite a bit or AGS in Suzuki speak. The shifts are smooth, the shift pause or the head shake between shifts is quite minimal and even the gear shifts are quite predictable. Interestingly, I had visited a technical seminar in between uh, with a gearbox manufacturer uh, that allowed me to drive a Swift with an AMT and paddle shifters for its manual operation. Apparently, it's not a very costly technology to integrate i really wish that suzuki had done that for the new swift considering it's a driver focused car they have tweaked the suspension though to make it a fun driver around bends and it has worked quite well the ride is supple the handling is predictable but the steering feel of the outgoing model is missed and should you decide to invest in the swift for spirited driving you might want to change the Kopia tires to something grippier. In terms of safety, the brakes are predictive and get ABS as a standard fit. Even the front airbags and the Isofix mounts are a standard fit. A common question is, should you upgrade to the new Swift if you already have the older one? Maybe yes, maybe not. If you already own a Swift in the LXI, LDI, VXI or VDI trims, then it could make sense upgrading. because you'll get safety features which are probably non-existent on your car you get newer technology better kit and of course the updated styling but if you already own the ZX or the ZDI trim of the Swift it may not make a lot of sense upgrading because the amount of money that you will spend doing so may not get you the kind of novelty that you would expect so I would rather have you stretch and buy the Bellino instead that brings us to the big question will the Bellino and the Swift cannibalize each other i don't think so Like I mentioned at the start of this review, Suzuki is well known for creating various options within the same car category and it has worked quite well for them on most occasions. In the case of the Swift and the Bellino, I think it will only make the premium hatchback pie larger. Instead of threatening each other, I think together they'll create a tougher challenge for the competition to tackle. Overdrive editor Shumi joins us to answer all of your motoring queries. Hi Shumi, our first question this week comes in from Aditya Bhardwaj. He is planning to buy a scooter for his parents. He says that they are aging, so his priorities are nimble and easy handling. Which scooter would you suggest? Okay, if you're going to go with nimble and easy handling, the easiest scooter to ride currently, as far as I'm concerned, is the Scooty Zest. If the Scooty Zest feels too small or too girly for you, I think the black one is not girly at all. But if it feels too small and too girly for you, head straight for the Suzuki showroom and get a ride on the Access. Is the easiest scooter to ride. It's extremely well made, very comfortable, and I promise you, your parents will be super happy with it. Up next, Sujay Banik writes in saying that he wants to upgrade to a 150 cc motorcycle and has shortlisted the Bajaj Pulsar 150, the Honda Unicorn 150, and the Yamaha SZRR. His priorities are low maintenance, comfort, good resale, and good fuel efficiency. What would you suggest to me? So, Jay, it's good to hear somebody bring up the Yamaha SZRR because I think it's the most underrated of the 150cc class commuter. It's a really sweet motorcycle. You should consider buying that. Yamaha's products, whether they sell well or not, they've always been very high quality, extremely reliable. You'll be happy. 
But the safe bet in that segment is the unicorn. It's always been there. It's always done well. It's a Honda. It'll run forever and the resale values are good. That's the motorcycle to buy overall. But the SZRR, you'd do well if you get one. Well, if you have any more queries, don't hesitate to send them to us at helpdesk at overdrive.co.in. That is our email address. You can also send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube, and we will get back to you on the show. In fact, if we don't manage to get back to you on the show, I promise that the team will answer your queries on the various social platforms. Right now, though, it's time for us to check out the latest launch from this week, which, of course, is uh, the Range Rover Velar, which was launched in a very gala event. Take a look. Land Rover India has introduced the new Range Rover Velar in India at 78.83 lakh rupees ex showroom and deliveries are set to commence soon. The Range Rover Velar first edition is the top spec variant and is the one powered by the V6 diesel. It is priced at 1.37 crore rupees ex showroom. The Velar sits on the same platform that also underpins the Jaguar F Pace and slots between the Range Rover Evoque and the Range Rover Sport. In flesh, the Range Rover Velar seems to borrow a few design cues from its bigger brother, the Range Rover Sport, but at the same time, it looks distinct as well. The bold front grille and LED headlamps are eye-catching, while the side profile is one of the best angles. The luxurious interiors are another highlight of the new Range Rover Velar. A unique aspect of the cabin is the large dual touchscreen. The top screen is for the infotainment system and navigation, while the bottom screen can be used to operate other functions such as activating the seat massager. The floating rotary dials for the air conditioner that sit below the bottom screen is a neat touch as well. The Velar has been launched with four engine options. The 2-litre turbocharged diesel Ingenium motor with 180 PS of power and 430 Nm of torque. The 3-litre V6 diesel which puts out 300 PS of power and 700 Nm of torque with a claim 0 to 100 km per hour time of 6.7 seconds. The petrol variants will be powered by 2-litre four-cylinder motors that puts out 250 PS of max power and 365 Nm of torque as well as 300 PS of power and 400 Nm of torque. Now to celebrate the opening of Harley-Davidson University in India, they invited journalists to tear down and rebuild their new Milwaukee 8 engines. Take a look. Welcome to the Harley-Davidson University. The organization has been around for 101 years and it's where Harley-Davidson trains its technicians and service people to know what to do when your bike needs service or has a problem. Me, I'm going to disassemble and reassemble a Milwaukee 8 engine today. And for somebody who doesn't work with their hands, this is going to be a lot of learning and a big challenge. The two things I'm familiar with though, safety goggles and now safety shoes. But under the watchful eyes of John McEnany and his team and a well-documented service manual that tells you exactly what to do, I was a lot more confident about what our team was expected to deliver. And that was not a simple task, let's be honest. The engine was already out of the bike and on the bench. It only had the main engine and manifolds, no gearbox or other stuff to deal with. But this is still a large displacement, part liquid cooled, counterbalanced V-twin. But to be honest, the Harley Davidson University isn't designed for mechanically inept people like me. What it's meant to do is train service technicians from Harley dealers to work on the bike. So the students are generally organized into courses like an engine program or a chassis program and they come with some mechanical skills already in the bag, unlike us. Here's the problem with engine assembly. We put everything in and we were about to close the cases and then the experts came and reminded us uh, you need to mount the thing to the engine first and this bolt, we forgot to put this bolt in. While we continue to build the engine, here's a little bit more background into the Harley-Davidson University. So the Harley-Davidson University is a, it's a facility where our, our retail business partners can uh, bring their people for both technical and non-technical training. It's the primary function of the facility. It's quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite an agenda or a schedule of training that we have throughout the year. 
we offer both technical and non-technical training. The training offers everything from beginning to end, from, from our very early models right up to our most current models, such as the latest uh, soft tail that we've just released. Typically there will be more courses around the current models because that's where the, the training is required, but we certainly offer training that goes uh, all the way back to, to early models. So for a technical classroom, typically we, we only run eight students at a time, and that's to ensure that they get the attention and, and the, um, the space to be able to conduct the work and, and, and in a safe working operational environment. For non-technical courses, we can sometimes run 12 or more participants, depending on the, on the topic that we're running. Uh, we have everybody from, from beginner level to, to uh, master level. A beginner level might be somebody who's recently joined a dealership and they may be attending what's called a product knowledge or a brand immersion training. So you've got to remember with a company that's coming up to 115 years of age, we have a lot of history and our DNA, the way we started, is something that we like all people within the dealership to, to know and to be able to understand the, the beginnings of the Harley Davidson Motor Company up till today. So a, a brand immersion course is one, for example, where somebody new to the brand would come right up to somebody who's already at an expert master technician level doing advanced electrical diagnosis training. There's lots of technical advancements that happen in the Milwaukee 8, but probably the most noticeable is the, the eight valves uh, which is incorporated in the cylinder heads. So, uh, you know, for people who are, for technicians in the, in the dealerships, they have to understand the workings of that, how, what is the correct procedures for doing adjustments for, for um, modifications when we do engine upgrades, all those sorts of things. So, so the, the engines are continuing to evolve and as they evolve, we continue to offer that product training. So we have best in class technicians at our, at our Harley Davidson uh, facilities. At the moment, the, the university is exclusively for our retail business partners to ensure that they have the best trained, the most competent, capable, uh, well-educated staff in their facilities. Is there a potential to open it up in future? Perhaps, but at this point in time, uh, it, is, it is exclusive for our dealer network. But tearing the engine down and labelling the parts properly did help. We weren't really feeling that shaky anymore. So I'm not somebody who really works with my hands but I did get the front cylinder put and Rishabh's now working on the rear cylinder and the amount of nuance and finesse that is required to get the thing to seat and then the satisfaction of seeing the piston rise up in the board like it's supposed to, it's huge. We really should do more stuff with our hands and I don't know, I think we're just culturally not inclined to do it and, and so we don't but this has been an amazing learning experience so far. And then, with our confidence sky high, we blundered. So we made a couple of mistakes during assembly of the engine and we had to go back a few steps and fix them. Uh, and it's cost us a lot of time. And I'm now afraid that we'll be one of the few people today who will not finish assembling the engine in time. And it's heartbreaking, it really is heartbreaking. The Harley Davidson University is important. Service quality and capability will be among the top decision factors for premium bike buyers very shortly and the focus and investment on that side of the business even in the face of high staff attrition rates is commendable on the part of Harley Davidson. And we didn't do so badly either. We rectified our mistake and then continued on to finish the engine in the nick of time, one of the few engines on the day that had no damage, nothing broken and a high likelihood of running right if started up. Thankfully, the Harley-Davidson University has training engines meant for exactly this routine of working and learning and if we did make any catastrophic mistakes, no one would find out. Phew! But Peter McKenzie did mention that this workshop was not open to the public. It is exclusively designed just for the dealerships. But we would like to thank the Indian team for allowing us to be a part of this unique experience and also for these interesting engineering lessons. Time then for us to wrap up this week's episode of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye and many thanks for watching.